Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, adapted from the novelization by J.R. Millward, based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield, with J.R. Millward and Adam Coover, with music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Episode 20. With hindsight, one probably shouldn't make sarcastic remarks in front of half-demonic evil geniuses. It only pisses them off. A force like a wrecking ball slugged me in the stomach. Had I been standing next to a pillar or struck the far wall with my head or back, it would have killed me instantly. Instead, I tucked into a ball and tumbled base over apex for about a dozen meters. My ribs screamed in red-hot protest, but I was alive to hear them. Ugh, I blinked through the fog of stars, just in time to see the shape looming above me and dodge away from the crunch of smashed concrete. Dust cascaded from Eckhart's glove as he pulled it back, taking aim once more. Pure chance prompted me to swerve left instead of right. I scrambled out of reach, almost falling over from the tremors as Eckhart's fist crashed down again, right where my ribcage would have been. My ears were ringing and every breath felt like swallowing broken glass. Gods, he was fast. Sidestepping several meters, I took aim with the Viper, counting on the extra half second to increase my accuracy. The gun chattered on full automatic and shredded across his immaculately tailored suit. Holes appeared in the wall behind him, but Eckhart merely jerked at the impacts. Blood sprayed in random gouts from the gaping tears in his flesh, but he looked up, seemingly disinterested. I ceased firing, and in the abrupt silence gazed in disbelief as the blood reversed its direction, soaking back through the holes like water being sucked up a straw. It seemed as though mere seconds went by. Thoughtfully, he picked at the now clean rips in his clothes and focused his gaze once more upon me. He smiled horribly. Tell me, Miss Croft, how many bullets does that gun hold? There was no warning but inevitability. I knew he was lunging for me even before he spread his gloved hand wide. His fingers become eviscerating claws. Any self-respecting killing machine would have done the same in his position. And it was exactly what I was hoping for. Fresh pain charred through my arm and I buckled, gritting my teeth against the terrible momentum. Eckhart let out a bellow that shook the stalactite festooned ceiling and I dropped into a roll, eager to put some distance between us. Silvery blue light wreathed him like arcs of possessive lightning and lifted his thrashing body several feet off the ground. The shard's milky white hilt protruded from his right pectoral just below his shoulder. Gotcha! But something was wrong. The light suddenly changed, flaring sickly yellow fingers through the shard's cobalt nimbus. I backed off, uncertainty running through me. With a wrenching cry, Eckhart's body spasmed and began floating back to Earth. His face contorted as he wrestled back control until he could stand, teeth bared in hatred. The area around the blade was peeling away, 
blackening before my eyes like a speeded up necrosis. But the pain only seemed to make him angrier. He seemed unable to touch the shard or make any attempt to pull it free. He raised his hand and I saw that the sand glyph was still held tightly in his grasp. Die! My world dissolved in fire. I had my eyes closed. This is the end, I thought, as flames roared over me in a blazing shroud. Part of me was relieved to feel no pain. Apart, of course, from the injuries I'd carried with me into the chamber. It's actually quite a nice feeling. Really, it wasn't much worse than when I travelled across the desert with Putai. The sensation transported me back to the open dunes, with the Harmerton wind howling like the breath of a furnace, and the sun god's sacred hawks circling on the thermals high above me. And there, in the arms of Eckhart's deadly holocaust, I heard their triumphant cries. Horus? Peace, Lara. Open your eyes. Your battle is not over yet. When I did, I almost laughed in shock. Eckhart was snarling, his whole frame twisted with effort as he poured forth wave after wave of oily flames from the sand glyph. The noise was incredible and the air sizzled and shimmered with heat. Yet, as I lifted my arms, I felt it as nothing more than a pleasant breeze, caressing my limbs, ruffling my hair. How? This creature is not unlike my uncle. The Black Alchemist knows only gold and the sweet rot of death. Fire is my servant and will not obey him, even if he should amass so for a thousand years. Then he can transmute the Sanglyph's energy into what he wants. Whatever he wants. But its fire can't hurt me. Even so, you saved my land from my uncle's wrath, and were reborn in the desert's heart, Lord. We protect you now, as we swore to. A debt must be paid, must it not? Eckhart's mouth twisted in fury, and he dropped his hand. The inferno died, leaving behind dribbling nodules of melted stone. A perfect, soot-charred circle more than ten meters across, with me completely unharmed at its center. It's just not his day, is it? Yeah, you just try that again, you dried-up old god wannabe. Unfortunately, Eckhart was a quick learner. Even without being privy to my internal conversation, he must have realized that mere pyrotechnics weren't going to finish me off. Without warning, he knelt and plunged his hand into the ground. The air stirred, crackling with unseen forces. My knees buckled and I was slammed to the floor. So hard and so painfully that I thought for a wild moment I'd been crushed by a train. The gantries groaned and squealed making me think the entire chamber was going to come crashing down around our ears. Eckhart was laughing. Manic, delirious laughter. The cackling made me want to scream, but no matter how hard I struggled, I could not break free. A deadly pressure was building in my chest, 
making each breath shallower than the last. I felt my heart quiver with the strain. Gravity. He's playing with the damn gravity. The pressure kept increasing, as though I were trapped under a mechanical roller, with every cavity in my body feeling like it was being crumpled like a drinks can. Just as the scarlet tide claimed my vision, the awful force relented, and I came back to full consciousness in a starburst of pain. I gasped, utterly disorientated, and a shadow fell across me. Eckhart's breath smelt of old tombs, and I felt the Sandglyph's baleful aura brush my cheek as his other hand enclosed my throat. Dimly, the part of my brain still attached to reality remembered, he's a villain, and villains like to play with their food. Good guys are the ones who kill cleanly. Still only mortal. You have remarkable vitality, Miss Croft. Almost as much as a loose veritatis. I will harvest you slowly. And when I'm done, I will give your body to the Nephilim as tribute. It will be hungry after such a long sleep. My hand closed on a sliver of ice. What can I say? I'm one of the good guys. <laughs> Eckhart tumbled backwards, as though struck by a charging bull, with the shard sunk deep into the flesh above his navel. A glacial cold wind whipped at his clothes as the shard's light engulfed him once again, wrenching inhuman, tormented howls from his throat. My whole body felt weak and dizzy as I struggled to my feet. Automatically, my hand went for my pistol, reassuring me with its familiar weight. It took longer for him to wrestle free this time. He tried calling on the Sandglyph as a shield, but the device's throbbing darkness kept getting battered down by the power of the light which held him. It was a battle between two forms, one silver bright and cold, and the other bloated with an urgent, searing hunger that nothing could fulfill. Just when I thought that neither could gain the ascendancy, Eckhart suddenly tumbled, landing awkwardly on all fours. The warring conflagration faded, leaving only a broken old man. Decay was spreading across his belly in a rippling tide, and he crawled away from me with one hand clutching his wound, limping and panting like an animal. Blackened flesh writhed and fell through his fingers like maggots dripping off a corpse. Some small part of me, perhaps the little girl that had played in the Royal Botanic Gardens, urged me to end it quickly. But the part that had seen the harm he had inflicted whispered for me to let him rot slowly from within. It was the least he deserved. The Lux Veritatis had imprisoned him in a pit for five centuries, and the prospect of leaving him this way for another half millennium seized me with sudden, intense attraction. Eckhart was whimpering. His glasses had fallen off, and his once smouldering red eyes were dull black like a fire that has been dampened and forgotten. 
The final shard gleamed as I drew it from my pocket. A blade of burning ice that grew brighter with every step I took towards the wounded monster. He must have recognized me, even through the fog of his own pain. For his face turned fearful, perhaps for the first time in his miserable life. Yes, feel that, you monster. This is what you made your victims feel, time after time. How many have you killed, Eckhart? Or did you even bother to keep count? How many lives have you destroyed and would have ruined with your great work? I felt my lips parting, every breath seeming to intensify the pleasure of seeing him so helpless. Faces blurred across my vision. Verna and Carvier, Wren, even Bouchard. Curtis's lingered most intensely of all. The man who had lost his own father to this monster, but hadn't given up hope of revenge. Every gasp of agony from the creature at my feet was a gift to his victims, in this century and those before it. Eckhart had thrown everything he had at me, but in the end, I was the one left standing, with the power to prolong his agony a year for every second of misery he had brought to those I cared about. But suddenly another thought burst into my mind. You might not realize when your desire for justice turns into need for revenge. You may choose either, but vengeance will not help you to forgive Von Kroy for abandoning you. Uh, how will I know the difference? You will know. Your healing is going well. By the time the choice comes, you will know. Grief and revulsion like nothing I had ever felt before shattered my thoughts, almost making me drop the shard. With difficulty, I mastered my trembling and looked on Eckhart with fresh eyes. All I saw was an old man, wretched and pathetic. The perfect mirror of my future if I gave in to those desires. Would anyone be willing or able to give me my death blow if I became the monster in his place? Unbidden, my thoughts returned to Curtis. I raised the shard to strike. As I did, Eckhart's mouth lifted in a triumphant smile, and someone grabbed my wrist from behind. I landed on my back, wrist burning where the shard was wrenched from my grasp. In the space of a heartbeat, I trained my pistol on the figure looming above me. The shard held high and shining in his right hand. The blonde-haired man was as expressionless as a block of ice, his gaze even colder than the shard poised above my heart. I tried to swallow, but couldn't. Corel? There was a sound, a dry, hacking whisper, like the rustle of dead leaves in winter. Eckhart was laughing. <laughs> Go on, kill her, kill her! 
Corel's eyes never left mine. And then he whirled, fluid as a snake, and buried the shard in Eckhart's forehead. I was on my feet in an instant as the old man gave one long, gurgling scream and then slumped forward. The shard's light blazed as the flesh around it blackened and disintegrated, falling away from the skull even as the bones became ash. Something insubstantial as smoke fought its way loose from the corpse's mouth and vanished with a thin wail far beyond the reach of normal hearing. Maggie regained her senses first and shut my mouth for me. I knew you'd find the third shard. He was right. You are resourceful. But why? You worked for him. No. Unknowingly, he worked for me. When he tried to kill your friend, I knew his usefulness was ended. Will you destroy his work? Of course not. The great work must be finished. Eckhart put so much effort into it while he lasted. He came so close until you proved why he was no longer needed. I'm merely offering you the chance to become part of a benign new order in the world. Make no mistake, it is more than Eckhart planned for you and your kind. My kind? Something isn't right. Corel cocked his head and I hurriedly shushed my inner voice. My thoughts felt fuzzy. His expression clouded with sorrow, giving me a glimpse of something so much older and so much wiser than a simple human woman could ever understand. The empathy would have broken my heart, but then he changed. The lawyer's frame rippled and reformed, its contours sharpening and his physique taking on a gaunt, ethereal beauty. His pupils dilated until the eyes were spheres of polished obsidian. Scars, ancient as the fault lines of the earth, crept across his cheeks and forehead and curled into the depths hidden by his blood-red scarf. I caught a whiff of his scent, a heady, sweet perfume like late summer flowers. His fingers grew so long that the dove gray gloves peeled away, revealing skin like polished mother of pearl. Only his hair remained the same, the strands so pale and fine as to be mistaken for spider silk. My breath faltered. He was so beautiful. We Nephilim have only been trying to survive. Outcasts for millennia, driven to the brink of extinction. What would you do if you were the last of your race? knowing that you could save them with the help of another, stronger species. And how grateful you would be. How well you would reward Lara. those who helped you. Lara! Wake up, Lara! Can't you see what he's doing? <sighs> Shocked, I woke and suddenly saw the scene through Maggie's eyes. Had he tried convincing me with brute force, I would have resisted automatically. But Corel wove a subtler net. His words have been like silken pillows and a goose-down mattress. Soft, welcoming, and so awfully tempting to my exhausted, injured body and mind. It had almost overcome me, 
and only my subconscious had realized the truth. Too, too many people have died for me to trust you, including a good friend. Von Croy. He was an unfortunate victim of history, Lara. Eckhart was stupid to have killed him. I've helped you all along, both here and in Paris. And before my eyes, he changed again. Too quickly for my eye to follow. Who else would have told you so much about the Cabal? Or the vault of Trovis? Why don't you need to have that information? Who helped you into the Strahov and gave you what you needed to defeat security? Who helped the last of the Lux Veritatis find his way here in time to help you? And who protected him from the Cabal? when he left the Louvre with the fourth painting. And who has been watching over your every move, keeping Eckhart's pets out of your way so that you could succeed, diverting security, planting information? You can trust me, Lara Croft. I felt feverish, like living through a nightmare blending memory and imagination. My all-too-real exhaustion was making me sway on my feet, and Corel's transformations only added to the sense of surrealism. It was too much to absorb, too much to make sense of. But then something caught my eye. Corel's hand, reaching in a gesture of trust to match his smile. The palm was turned upwards, and there, etched deep into the flesh, was a scar. A couple of lines within a circle, nothing special, unless I'd seen it before. My inner self rushed to catch me, even as the memory broke the banks of amnesia and flooded my perception. You have located the painting for me. Why have you not retrieved it? I can't collect it. It's too dangerous. But, but she would be able to. No! has finished. You humans break so easily. <sighs> that scar. It was you. You killed Von Croy. Dear Laura, is one man's life worth throwing away your future? He left you to die. He was human. <laughs> I felt a tightness in my chest. Hot tears ran down my cheeks, and I laughed like someone who has finally gotten the joke. And I had. Why do you laugh? Because I forgive him. How could I hate someone who had taught me so much? He's a reason why I'm me. Maybe it's a mortal thing. You probably wouldn't understand. Uh, wrong thing to say. Glowering, Corel's lips pulled back, exposing pointed teeth. Mortal, I was there when your race still lived in caves and squabbled like rabid dogs for food. If any race deserved to flourish, it was mine. We were the chosen, the strongest and best of all. Nature does not forgive the weak. Maybe not, but Verna was still my friend. You're being a fool. 
What can I say? She's a sucker for the underdog. So be it. The bullets were only a distraction. I already knew Corel would shrug them off as easily as raindrops. But Corel was not my real target. He leapt aside from the stream of gunfire and vanished behind a pillar with a speed that made Eckhart's acrobatics look like a stegosaurus plodding through a swamp. I dived towards the corpse. Well, if you could still call it that. The shards had reduced the black alchemist to a man-shaped pile of ash that yielded to my fingers like dense smoke. In less than a second, I had found all three shards and stuffed them into my pack. There was something else under there, too. If this doesn't work, I'll say it was your idea. I shook the monstrum's glove free of soot. I hesitated only a moment before slipping it onto my right hand. It came up past my elbow and stank, like pushing my hand into a vat of rotting meat. Oh. Steady, girl. Now hurry. I heaved, but managed to maneuver the sand glyph until I could grasp it tightly. The metal reacted like a spooked cobra, and within moments had wound its tendrils into the very fabric of the glove. My nausea vanished like a switch being thrown. Instead, I felt the kind of euphoria normally associated with firing up my Harley V-Rod with all its power thrumming at my fingertips. A sizzling bolt of energy flashed across my vision. It was only when the green glow faded that I realized I'd thrown my hand out instinctively and that the deadly energy had dissipated harmlessly through the glove. It acted like a lightning rod, leaving me unhurt, but flushed with adrenaline. If anything, the sand glyph felt even more potent than before. Blimey. Corel loomed into view, hovering in a halo of that same greenish-blue energy. His angelic countenance was no less beautiful, no less perfect, but the hatred in his eyes revealed it for the mask it was. Underneath lurked something corrupt and older than time. Another bolt sizzled past my ear. Unlike Eckhart, Carell wasn't one to waste effort with melodramatic gloating. Just my luck. I parried the blows as he pressed his attack. Every time I deflected with the glove, I felt the sand glyph's hunger swell. The more energy it absorbed, the more it wanted to absorb. It was a craving in my mind, like an aching thirst, with each fresh infusion a tiny sip that left me wanting more. It didn't take long for me to realize I was sweating and my heart was thumping with near-orgasmic intensity. No wonder Eckhart went mad. Snap out of it! You're going to get yourself killed! Get to the sleeper! End this! Now! My inner voice cut through the exhilaration with all the tact of an ice cube slipping down my back. Muzzly. I stumbled across to the fallen gantry and began to climb the twisted metal. The razor edges cut my left hand and the sudden pain was electrifying. The sand glyph was even feeding off my emotions. Inspiration struck just as Corel rounded a pillar. I faced him, a mad gleam in my eye. The crackling arc was loose before he even realized what I was doing, which was concentrating like I'd never concentrated before. Think of a happy thought. Any happy little thought. After all, if Eckhart could do it, why not me? The sand glyph flared as it gulped down the energy. 
No mere deflection this time, but the entire bolt. My thoughts coalesced and I felt myself hurtling upwards as if fired from a cannon. Let me tell you, gravity is overrated. Energized by Corel's energy bolt, I flew right up into the nest of wiring beside the sleeper. The whole edifice crackled with energy discharges, any one of which could have stopped my heart. But the sand glyph shone in my hand like the eye of the devil and channeled every deadly bolt before it could do me harm. Its manic light glowed brighter every second as its appetite swelled to titanic proportions. My hair stood on end as I beheld the sleeper. Its jaw hung slack and its wide open, unblinking eyes were the color of rubies. My nose was full of the stink of ozone overlaid by another smell that had no place in a mad scientist's laboratory. It was the smell of sunlight and hibiscus flowers, fresh cut summer grasses and wide horizons. This creature, no, I corrected, this person had walked the earth in the garden of its youth. Perhaps he had had family, angelic like their fallen fathers, or human like the women who had borne them. Maybe he too had known friendships and betrayals, love and grief, as he lived under the open sky and felt the sun's warmth on his skin. And yet here we were, tangled in a nightmare of technology and death, uncounted fathoms beneath the ground. Neither of us would see the sunlight again. My thoughts went to Salia. Without hesitation, I plunged the sand glyph into the sleeper's fragile heart and tugged my arm free of the glove. I felt the power leave me like the surf drawing back from the beach. It didn't bother me that I was already dead. I was going to be taking Corel with me. After all, the waves only draw back ahead of a tsunami. A cable caught me around the waist, almost knocking the wind from me. But then my hands were reaching out to grab it, to ride it down like some mad stunt double. My subconscious tucked my body up to land in an ankle-saving roll just as the rumbling overcame my hearing. Like I'm going to let you die now. I was running, even as the whole chamber exploded in dazzling light. The noise hit me seconds later. Over the scream of metal and blasts of exploding concrete, something hard struck my head, and I knew no more. A lump the size of a tennis ball throbbed in the dark. In the silence, I gradually realized the lump was attached to my head, and the realization brought with it a whole explosion of new pains. I was trapped with thousands of tons of rubble between me and the Lara. Egyptian desert. Are you still with me? Lara! Lara! <sighs> Memories replayed through my mind. The sand glyph wrapped around my arm like a parasitic golden snake. The chamber collapsing pulled inwards by the irresistible forces I'd unleashed. Corel, howling, clawing futilely at passing masonry. The 
the sleeper, exploding from the energies within, its blank eyes snapping open for one terrible instant of full consciousness before oblivion. The ground rushing up to claim me. The doorway. The steps. The lab. Oh, what? Maggie? Who else? You're okay. That bruise on your skull isn't bleeding. Thank the gods. I thought I'd lost you. Spending the rest of my life alone in here would get really boring. <laughs> oh. Curtis! <clears throat> yeah, I thought he'd be down here by now too. Come on, we better hurry. I don't know how much damage that blast did to the foundations. Nothing would satisfy me until I saw that Curtis was okay. The ground continued to tremble as I made my way back to where I'd left him to fight Boaz. Each new twist in the tunnel had me hoping to run into him coming the other way, only to be disappointed. Every step made me wince with fresh pains. My body was running on the dregs of its reserves, but at that moment I simply did not care. My thoughts circled and fought each other. He stalked me for days. He tried to protect me. He made me look like an amateur. He could have killed me, but didn't. At last the corridors ended, and I was back in Eckhart's grisly idea of an arena. He wasn't there. The reek of death was overpowering, but the lump that had risen in my throat was even worse. Somebody had let down the ladders. Simply climbing down them was agonizing, but I hardly noticed. I limped around Boaz's corpse, alarming even in death, until I reached her second corpse. The bodies oozed acid green ichor and looked to have died with more than even my usual quota of violence. Close by was another slick of spilled gore. Lots of it. Definitely human. No. My knees were hot and sticky where I knelt in the blood. In a detached sort of way, I was aware of my triumph crumbling, falling apart from the inside. Even Maggie seemed too shocked to offer a witty remark. The unfairness struck me so hard I wanted to scream. Even I knew it was a childish reaction, one brought on as much by exhaustion and injury as disappointment. And a small part acknowledged that Curtis had at least killed his foes before he died. But right then and there, I just didn't give a damn. My hand touched something hidden in the blood. Numbly, I drew out the disc-shaped device Curtis had always carried at his side. The device that had almost taken my head off and that had been shining and alive the last time I saw it. Now, it was dead too. Without thinking, I slipped my fingers through the grip. A surge went up my arm and I blanched, almost dropping it. With a hiss, the blood dissolved revealing living gold beneath. I felt it tugging me to my feet, and a voice that wasn't a voice at all spoke in the depths of my mind. Greetings, Lara Croft. That wasn't me. This wasn't just words in my head, but an entirely separate presence. There was none of the Sandglyph's sinister hunger, if anything, it was the polar opposite, a force that gave power rather than took it. 
Just holding it was like gulping down three litres of black coffee after a week-long massage. And even my cracked ribs started to feel a little better. The disc sparkled in my grasp and drew my arm almost in a full circle to face the yawning doorway on the arena's opposite wall. He's alive. Hope. Help us. Soothing ripples tingled through my arm, accompanied by a sense of gentle laughter and understanding. I don't know what it is, but I like it. Chirigai. Its name is Chirigai. And we've got to hurry. Full of hope, I slipped the disc into a loop at my belt and strode away into the darkness. In episode 20 of Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, Lara Croft and Saleya were played by J.R. Millward. Curtis Trent, Pieter van Eckhart, Horus, Joachim Carell, Thomas Ludick, Louis Bouchard, and Professor Werner von Croy were played by Adam Coover. Written and adapted by J.R. Millward. Based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield. With music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Additional sound effects courtesy of www.freesfx.co.uk, the BBC and the YouTube Audio Library. Produced by Stephen Millward. Lara Croft and Tomb Raider are the property of Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix.